Hello YouTubers, welcome to Big Buddha is Watching, I'm Big Buddha. So guess what, I've just turned 42. And as The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one of my favourite things ever, I thought this year would be as good a time as ever to do a series of videos on it. I say it's my favourite thing ever because it's difficult to pinpoint what you would describe Hitchhikers as. It's appeared in so many mediums over the years. It started life as a radio series. It was then adapted into a series of successful novels, a television series, a text-based video game, a movie and even a towel. So over the next few coming months, I thought I'd take a look at some of these iterations in more detail. So sorry to my regular fans, if you're not a Hitchhikers fan, this isn't going to be the channel for you, I'm afraid. But hey, it's what I want to do. Hitchhikers started out life as a radio series, which is what I will be looking at here. It ran for a couple of series on Radio 4 between 1978 and 1980. It was then revived for a further four series in 2004 to 2018. Series 1, or the primary phase, was initially broadcast from March to April 1978. It was the brainchild of Douglas Adams and starred Simon Jones as Everyman Arthur Dent, Jeffrey McGiven as the alien Ford Prefect, Mark Wing Davy as the President of the Galaxy, Zaphod Beeblebrox, Susan Sheridan as astrophysicist Trillian, Stephen Moore as Marvin the Paranoid Android and Peter Jones as the voice of the guide. The initial concept by Adams was to do a series of six one-off stories, each culminating in the destruction of planet Earth. However, after Adams wrote the pilot script, Adams, being one of our great logical thinkers, contemplated what the consequences would be of the Earth being destroyed for the last remaining member of the human race, and decided to explore the story of this character further. From this initial need to further the story, Adams's imagination took the listeners on a journey through time and space, which encompassed such bizarre concepts as a visit to the planet Magrathea, whose stock in trade was the construction of other planets. You know we built planets, oh, do you? Well, yes, I, I'd sort of gathered. The search for the answer to life, the universe and everything, and the joke being that the answer in the end turned out to be 42. The answer to everything. Yes? Life, the universe, and everything. Yes? Is. Yes? Is. Yes? 42. We are going to get lynched, you know that. The revelation that the Earth itself isn't a planet after all, but a giant supercomputer constructed to find the ultimate question to that answer. A computer which can calculate the question to the ultimate answer. A computer of such infinite and subtle complexity that organic life itself will form part of its operational matrix. And it shall be called the Earth. Huh. Oh, what a dull name. A visit to Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe. I've sussed it. What? what? This must be Millie Ways. Millie Ways? Yes, Millie Ways. The restaurant at the end of the universe. End of what? And in the end, having the main characters stranded on a primitive planet and it turning out to be prehistoric Earth. What's it to them that this place happens to be called the Earth? And that it happens to be my original home. Yeah, but you won't even be born for nearly two million years. Adams employed an out-of-left-field linking device, narration from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an electronic book, and what is described as the standard repository for all knowledge and wisdom, which Arthur's best friend Ford Prefect turns out to be a reporter for. The narration is done by comedian Peter Jones and is arguably the most successful and memorable aspect of the series. This is the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, perhaps the most remarkable, certainly the most successful book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor. You have to remember in 1978, comedy science fiction was quite a new concept. Adams is a legitimate science fiction writer but he was also a great comedy writer as well. 
Adams being a Cambridge alumni, the humour feels very Python-esque. The concept of someone's house being destroyed to make way for a bypass. The plans have been available in the planning office for the last nine months. Yes, I went round to find them yesterday afternoon. You hadn't exactly gone out of your way to call much attention to them, had you? I mean, like actually telling anybody or anything. On the same day that the planet Earth is destroyed to make way for a hyperspace bypass. All the planning charts and demolition orders have been on display at your local planning department in Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years, so you've had plenty of time to lodge any formal complaints, and it's far too late to start making a fuss about it now. <laughs> Feels very much like a Monty Python sketch. The series has a couple of early appearances from future major stars like Jim Broadbent. I am Vroom Vandal, and that is not a demand. That is a solid fact. What we demand is solid facts. No, we don't. That's precisely what we don't demand. Oh. And David Jason. So we're actually going to land in a minute? Well, not, not, not so much land, in fact. I think, as far as I can remember, we're programmed to uh, crash on it. Crash? crash? Uh, yes. It's all part of the plan, I think. There was a terribly good reason for it, which I can't quite remember at the moment. You're a load of useless bloody loonies! Ah, yes, that was it. That was the reason. Got it. Adams was notoriously bad at deadlines, and as the series was written, the scripts came in later and later, to a point where the final two episodes were actually co-written by future producer John Lloyd. He was responsible for writing large portions of the Millie Ways sequence, the restaurant at the end of the universe, and indeed the resolution to the Zaphod and Trillian storyline, the Hagunennons, wasn't actually used in any subsequent iterations or adaptations of these episodes. I suspect so Adams could put his own stamp on things. The Hagninnans of Asitatus III have the most impatient chromosomes of any life form in the galaxy. Whereas most races are content to evolve slowly and carefully over thousands of generations, their genetic structure is so chronically unstable that far from passing their basic shape onto their children, they will quite frequently evolve several times over lunch. The primary phase is one of my favourite things ever, just in any medium. Six half hours of sublimely brilliant and imaginative comedy, and the thing that's propelled me into a lifelong love of Hitchhikers. Five stars out of five. Owing to the success of the series on radio, it was repeated a couple of times in 1978, and at the end of the year we got a Christmas special. This episode is now generally seen to be actually the first episode of the second season, even though there was a 12 month gap between the two. Actually for years I didn't even realise this was a Christmas special separate from the secondary phase. It serves as a season opener, ends on a cliffhanger and is not really a separate story unto itself. Ford and Arthur don't even get off prehistoric earth in this one. You've got all that electric hitchhiking equipment in your satchel and none of it seems to do a dicky bird. We're just too far from the space lanes. The range is limited. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Christmas. I came to myself in a dream and said, go see Zani Whoop. Never heard of the cat before, but I seemed very insistent. <laughs> oh, Mr. Beeblebrock, sir, <laughs> you're so weird, you should be in pictures. Yeah, baby, and you should be in real life. The secondary phase, which was broadcast over five nights from the 8th to the 12th of January 1980, was only five episodes long, as opposed to the previous series six. So generally, these episodes and the Christmas special are considered to be one long season. Apparently the scripts were so late that actors had to be cast by Jeffrey Perkins without actually having any characters written for them and was done in order to provide Adams with ideas. And you can kind of tell. Uh, excuse me. Huh? Who are you? Uh, me? Ah, well, you see, what it is, you see, is I'm Poodoo. And look, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you busy? What? Yes. Uh, can I just ask you something? No. In a minute. Please get back. Unlike the previous season, which is almost perfect in every respect, this one is only half successful. And it's the first half, really, which was harvested by Adams for the restaurants at the end of the universe. His first Hitchhiker's novel was only an adaptation of the first four episodes of the primary phase. The second novel is essentially an adaptation of the first half of the secondary phase and the second half of the primary phase. With me?
And you can kind of see why he was reluctant to maybe adapt the second series in its entirety. There's some great stuff in there, don't get me wrong, but there's also some stuff that isn't maybe quite as well thought through as things like Magrathea and Milliways from the first season. Like a race of bird people who evolved because of something to do with shoes. But through all the generations that have passed since we deserted the surface of this planet, girded up our limbs and shook the dust off our... From our things, our whatchamacallits. Your what? Your face has been... Shook the dust from your what? Has been the one solitary candle that has illumined the recesses of our scraggy old bird brains. Why doesn't he want to say what you shook the dust from? Also, the primary phase has a nice pacing to it. Generally, two episodes per location. Whereas the secondary phase has a whole three episodes dedicated to the bird planet. So the material feels kind of stretched towards the end. For everything that doesn't work, like the character Lintilla. It's just a pseudo-fracture. Huh? Pseudo-fracture. It's artificially induced. All the pain, swelling and immobility of a fracture without the inconvenience of the fracture itself. Oh. There is still some good stuff in there. Especially the final scene where the characters meet the ruler of the universe, who turns out to be merely an old man in a shack who's way too existential for his own good. How can I tell that the past isn't a fiction designed to account for the discrepancy between my immediate physical sensations and my state of mind? Oh, that clears it up. He's a weirdo. Also, Trillian is missing from the action of the entire series, and I've never been able to fully ascertain a good enough reason why. So the second season is disappointingly less successful as the first, but then most things are less successful than the first season of Hitchhikers. So in that respect, he gets three and a half stars out of five from me. So after the secondary phase, we then get a 24 year break in the radio series timeline. Adams went off to do other things, novels, the TV show and the movie which was caught up in development hell for many, many years. He did actually propose a revival of Hitchhikers on radio in his lifetime. Sadly, he never saw it come to fruition owing to his untimely death in 2001. But in 2004, the mammoth task of adapting Adams' final three remaining Hitchhikers novels fell to radio writer-director Dirk Maggs. So understanding Hitchhikers on the radio, you do have to see it as two distinct phases. The primary and secondary phase being material that was written specifically to be performed on radio. And the final four series, the tertiary to hexagonal phases, which were radio adaptations of pre-existing works, albeit with largely the same cast. I say largely because obviously some of the actors had passed on in the interview 24 years. Richard Vernon, who played Slarty Bartfoss, sadly died in 1997 and was replaced by Richard Griffiths here. Probably the absence that is felt the worst is that of Peter Jones, who here is replaced by William Franklin as the voice of the guide. Franklin does an okay job, but short of getting Stephen Fry for the movie version, replacing the voice of the guide is just a tough act to follow. This is the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Perhaps the most remarkable, certainly the most successful book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor. Now in its 7 to the power of 16th edition, it has been continuously revised and upgraded, including being fitted with a highly experimental jog-jog-jog-proof, splash-resistant heat shield. And a sophisticated new voice circuit. Not always with complete success. Starting off the tertiary phase as an adaptation of the third novel, Like the Universe and Everything, posed a problem as the second half of the previous novel, The Restaurants at the End of the Universe, ends as an adaptation of the primary phase. The third novel begins with Arthur and Ford still on prehistoric Earth. Still with me? I haven't seen anyone for years. I can hardly even remember how to speak. I keep forgetting... Um, birthdays? Words! And so we get this situation where the entirety of the secondary phase has to be explained away. And it's explained away rather unimaginatively as a psychotic episode of Zaphod's. You had a double psychotic episode, ran off to Ursa Minor to prove some conspiracy theory, only to be found days later wandering the corridors of the Hitchhiker's Guide building looking for Zani Whoop, a free lunch and a stiff drink. But not in that order. 
Which proves I was there. They're all hallucinations. Yes, it was all a dream. The Dallas cop-out explanation. Not even something imaginative, like it was an alternative universe or anything. Obviously, the series has many different personnel behind the scenes. Gone is the sublime soundscape created by the Radiophonic Workshop. Uh, how are we for time? Um... And so the series generally have a different sound and tone from the first two. There's too much incidental music in the series, I feel, which often kills a lot of the comedy. I have made a decision. I've thought about it seriously and responsibly, and all things considered, it's the right thing for me. I feel good about it. And here it is. I will go mad. Good idea. What? I'll save the specifics of the plot for a later video, but suffice to say, I think where the series excels is when it cribs the portions of the story that feel tonally most like the material from the first series, i.e. the middle portion featuring Ford and Arthur at a flying party in the sky. Everywhere I touch, it hurts. Then don't touch it, you've sprained your wrist. What are you doing out here? They won't let us in without a bottle. Ah. There, I think I can help you. Got a bottle? Red Cena. Never heard of it. In you come. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the appearance of Agrajag, an imaginatively conceived character who continually gets killed accidentally by Arthur Dent and is reincarnated in another form in the next lifetime, only to be killed by him over and over again. Finally tires of this situation and seeks revenge in his final incarnation. What's noteworthy about this character in the series is that it actually uses Douglas Adams' performance from the audiobook versions. You know what you've done? He gurgled painfully. You've gone and killed me again! I mean, what do you want from me, blood? Nice to hear, and it actually fits in a lot better than you would expect. However, they do make, I think, the ill-advised decision to treat the voice, giving it an annoying lisp and sound effects over the top. You know what you've done? You've gone and killed me again! I mean, what do you want from me, blood? I'm sorry! I want to give a quick shout out to the music composer Paul Wicks Wiggins, a friend of Adam's in real life, who throughout the tertiary to quintessential phases produces some quite accurate sound alike songs. Like the universe and everything contains a description of a song sung by the people of cricket that would, in Adams' words, allow Paul McCartney to afford Essex. See how the flowers grow. It's such a shame my dog died He loved those flowers so I mean, obviously, the song produced here <laughs> probably wouldn't be able to do that but it's still quite a spot on McCartney-esque sounding composition nonetheless Overall, the tertiary phase really works best if you are familiar with life, the universe and everything. As an adaptation, it's a little muddled. Dirk Maggs has a propensity to be far too slavish to the original text, and the end result is only partially successful. Three stars out of five. The following year, we got the quandary and quintessential phases. These series, unlike the previous ones, were a mere four episodes long each and broadcast back to back beginning in May 2005, owing to the slenderness of the source material, and essentially made the Hitchhiker series four and five one long eight episode run. The first half, the quandary phase, is based on So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, and this is where it really becomes apparent that these installments are adaptations that were 
are not written for radio initially. By this point in the novel series, Adams had become far more used to penning prose for the novels rather than passages that sounded like entries for the guide. And of course the end result here is that you get guide entries sounding far more like descriptive action rather than the diversions and non sequiturs of the earlier series. And as Arthur looks at the conjunction of two Earths, one no longer existing, he awakes from the doze to find himself about 18 inches above the rose bushes of one of his neighbours. Idly, he wonders what he's doing above them and what is holding him there. And when he discovers that nothing is holding him there... Fish is the most problematic of the novels to adapt because it only really focuses on Ford and Arthur who spend a lot of their time on their own in the early stages of the novel and so we get a lot of dialogue which is obviously just adaptations of the prose with a slight perspective change and the story often falls into the trap of having the characters monologuing to themselves about what they see before them. Ah, headlights. Right. Confident smile, stick out thumb, and beg. Please stop! Please stop! My other car is also a Porsche. How about a sticker that says, I'm an unbelievable prat in any car? I've always felt a TV or film adaptation would work a lot better for the later novels. Jane Horrocks is cast as Fenchurch, a character who gets a brief mention in the first series and novel. In the novel and quandary phase, Arthur meets a resurrected version of this character and falls in love with her. This is not going to be easy. Hyde Park is stunning. You are stunning. Anyone who can go through Hyde Park with you on a summer's evening and not feel moved by it is probably going through in an ambulance with a sheet pulled over their face. I think that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. I have to say, I think Horrocks is miscast here. Maybe it's my own perspective, but I never really saw Fenchurch as being a Jane Horrocks type. The Quandary Face does have some of my favourite cameos of all the series, though. David Dixon, the Ford Prefect from the TV version, makes an all-too-brief appearance here. Are you all right? Actually, you're rather annoying me. Just like this? Astonishing, I know, but true. Do we know each other? Do I look like the sort of person who'd spend time with you? Sorry, must be having a deja vu. It's fun to hear him back interacting with Simon Jones. And the other cameos, I mean, there's some just totally out of left field. Jackie Mason as a mutated fish who appears to Ford in a dream. Could you please describe to me in concrete terms how life is like a grapefruit? Use your hands if it helps. Well, it's sort of orangey-yellow and dimpled on the outside, wet and squidgy in the middle. It's got pips inside, too. Oh, and some people have half a one for breakfast. Patrick Moore playing himself. The immediate perimeter is fenced off and patrolled by tiny flying robots. Staked out around that is the army, who in turn is surrounded by a cordon of police. Though whether they're there to protect the public and the army, or the army for the public, we just don't know. And Stephen Fry doing a delightful turn as Murray Bostock Henson, a character so outrageous you can only believe that Adams knew someone like this in real life. Fry's turn is very refreshing. He was a friend of Adams and surprisingly one of the few actors in these adaptations that really understands how to perform Adams' dialogue. This man is the bee's knees, Arthur. He is the wasp's nipples. He is, I would go so far as to say, the entire set of erogenous zones of every major flying insect in the western world we're calling him the rain god <laughs> nice don't you think? and perhaps the most surprising piece of casting is that of christian slater as wonko the sane in the novel the character is described as what would happen if you took david bowie and add three or four more david bowies onto his extraneous limbs i mean i can only guess that bowie himself was unavailable for this little cameo it seemed to me that any civilization that had so far lost its head as to need to to include a set of instructions in a packet of toothpicks was no longer one in which I could live and stay sane. But you are. Oh, I call myself Wonko the Sane, to reassure people. Wonko is what my mother called me when I was a clumsy kid. Knocking things over and sane is what I intend to remain. And the angels with the golden beards and green wings and orthopedic sandals agree with me. 
overall this story doesn't quite work on radio and of all the novels I've always thought it's the one that's calling out to be visualised. It's the most out of sync of the novels tonally, but I always thought it would make quite a nice British rom-com with a slight sci-fi edge, even more so than the movie adaptation. Having said that, it's probably still my personal favourites of the novel adaptations, so I'll give it a solid 3 out of 5. As I said, following on from the quandary phase, we got the quintessential phase broadcast between May and June 2005 and based on Mostly Harmless, the final hitchhiker's work to be penned by Adams. Here we get the delightful return of Sandra Dickinson, the US-born actress who played the TV version of Trillian. As the novel features an alternative reality version of Trillian, it was an ideal choice to cast her in this role as the alternative of reality, Trisha McMillan. Quite a few years ago, I met a guy at a party. Mm -hmm. He said he was from another planet. Okay. And did I want to go there with him? I think he had two heads. Two heads. It was that kind of party. Even if there is little explanation of the accent, Jonathan Price also returns to the series, playing Zani Whoop for the first time since the secondary phase. I'm your new editor-in-chief. That is, if the organization decides to retain your services. Organization? <laughs> that word isn't usually associated with the guide. Precisely our sentiments. Understructured, over-resourced, under-managed, over-inebriated. And that was just the editor. And Samantha Bayar is cast as random, Arthur Dent's estranged daughter. And you don't understand there's somewhere this watch belongs, where it works, where it fits! Random! Who I've never really liked as a character. Probably my favourite cameo in the entire series is that of Elvis. Here he's given the McCartney-esque song to sing. How much did you tip the singer? More money than the Colonel made for him in an entire career of doing rubbish movies and casino gigs just for doing what he does best, singing in a bar. And he negotiated it himself. We're out of here. Thanks, Al. Hey, take it easy for me. Y'all come back now. Now, for those familiar with the novels, one of the most controversial things in all the books is the ending to Mostly Harmless, which I've never liked because it's such a downer of a way to end the book series and totally at odds with the tone of the previous novels. I don't know what Adams was thinking, but it was probably a mere case of a creator sick of the albatross that he created. However, the ending of the novel I always felt was a real middle finger to the fans. The downer ending here is, as you would expect, retconned for a They All Lived Happily Ever After ending, which I was slightly happier to hear. Of course, my issue with it being that the Get Out explanation just isn't as imaginative as something that I'm sure Adams himself would have come up with. The explanation is the Babel fish transports the characters to multiple dimensions because... Apparently it can do that now, all of a sudden. Thus, as Earth's plural zone folds itself away like a card table after a particularly energetic hand of snap, the Babel fishes, their hosts, and any cetaceans in the vicinity simultaneously flick into existence in any alternative realities. The saving grace is that it does explain away the secondary phase as a parallel reality, which is a slightly better explanation than hallucinations. The ending at Milliways, where Fenchurch just happens to be working as a waitress, does feel laboured. Where, where did, did you, you go? go? I, I searched, searched for months. months. I thought I'd wait for you. Well, how did you know I'd come back? Well, this seemed as good a place as any. You're still here? But at least it's something compared to the downer ending of the book. This feels the most awkward of all the adaptations. The fact this material started life in another medium is most evident here. I just don't think this material translates that well. Each scene feels disconnected from the last, and it all has a very unfocused and inconsequential feel to it. Two and a half stars out of five. The ending of Fitz the 25th actually bills the following episode as the final episode of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in the last ever episode of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, what happens is inevitably what must happen. 
And for a year or two, it was thought that that was what it was going to be, there being no more material left to adapt. The cast obviously enjoyed the process of making these series, and they reunited for a stage tour in 2012, which incorporated material from all five of the previous seasons, to the delight of many Baying fans. However, in 2009, Owen Colfer, the Artemis Fowl author, penned a sixth installment of the Hitchhiker's series called And Another Thing, a novel which I have many issues with, but like I say, that's for another video. In 2018, an adaptation of the novel was broadcast to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the primary phase going out in 1978, essentially making it the sixth series of Hitchhikers on the radio, or the hexagonal phase as it's dubbed here, owing to the demise of one or two other members of the cast in the intervening 13 years. John Lloyd, friend and former flatmate of Adams, and if you remember, the one responsible for co-penning Fit the Fit, and six now plays the guide many tales are told of beings who have consulted that entirely astonishing work of reference the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and had their lives changed forever by it and owing to the sad demise of Susan Sheridan in 2015, Sandra Dickinson is now promoted to playing full-time Trillian. Samantha Bayar returns as random sadly and Jim Broadbent also has a couple of cameos for the first time since the primary phase as Marvin no less Marvin don't stand up I'm not worth the bother how well, something or other to see you what's the word I want nice how nice to see you hmm yes no it's not it never is I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed I don't really know why Marvin appears at all here, as he doesn't appear at all in the novel. One of the better decisions Colfer made was to not include Marvin, as he admired the way his death scene was written in So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. Stephen Moore had retired from acting at this point due to ill health, so it seemed an odd choice to include Marvin at all. The series, like the previous instalments, has no shortage of noteworthy cameos. Professor Stephen Hawkins, no less, appears in episode Episode 1. Who are you? I am the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Mark 2. You're the bird? Yes, my functionality is impaired. You knew me as the bird. You sound like prof- Others knew me in different forms. And the likes of Lenny Henry, Ed Byrne and John Culshaw also make appearances. Everything. Life, the universe, etc. With particular reference to the problem of where things ought to be. That is my special field. So, Mr. Cthulhu, are you an absentee landlord or a hands-on god? Oh, hands-on, absolutely. People need to know who is blighting their crops or demanding virgin sacrifice. And now I'm going to look away, but only because prolonged eye contact will drive you insane. I mean, either the series has a seriously great casting director, or Hitchhikers obviously has some major fans. Despite my problems with the novel, this does actually adapt a lot better than the final three Adams novels. It's not spectacular, but the best I can say is it is at least a nice way for the series to bow out after 40 years. Three stars out of five. So overall, Hitchhikers on the Radio, for me as a fan personally, was for many years just the primary and secondary phase. The final four series are really just mildly interesting appendages for me, and even the original run isn't entirely successful. However, what makes it a great piece of media is that first run of six episodes. Oh, the primary phase. Just one of the most sublimely brilliant pieces of comedy and science fiction writing ever put out in any medium. It still sounds amazing today. The casting is spot on. The jokes are pen to perfection. What can I say? It's been a a lifelong favourite of mine for many years. So thanks for joining me for this look at the first iteration of Hitchhikers, the radio series, and I hope you'll join me for the next few instalments of this series, where I'll take a short look at the novels. And until then, this is me, Big Buddha, signing off, and I really hope you know where your towel is.